Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfi. If you enjoy this programming, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Join Truth and Rhythm's membership program through Patreon. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkandstuff.net. At that site, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I am pleased to welcome to Truth and Rhythm, Rudy Wolfgram, who along with his seven siblings comprised one of the most successful pop, R&B, and dance music groups of the late 1980s, The Jets. Singing as well as playing instruments from 1985 to 1989, the family band singers and musicians scored five top 10 pop hits, which were also among their 11 top 30 R&B, adult contemporary, and dance singles. Those fun and catchy songs included Curiosity, Crush on You, You Got It All, Cross My Broken Heart, Rock It to You, and Make It Real. The Jets continue to tour and entertain enthusiastic audiences today. Rudy, thank you for joining me. How are you? Hey, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Glad yeah, to it's have a, you. yeah. When you were reading that off, I was like, "Wow, that's a that's a lot of time," you know. And now we're in 2024. Yeah, flies for sure. Um, yeah, because I remember, you know, I was a um, disc jockey, you know, in the 80s, oh. and so uh, for uh, clubs, and so okay. you know, I was in the record pool and all that, and I got all the 12 inch singles from the Jets, and you know, definitely uh, they were crowd pleasers during my uh, years in the 80s DJing. So I greatly appreciated that. Yeah, one thing about uh, that time period when a single would come out, as you know, the 12-inch would come out, and I remember looking at Billboard and knowing that the the club versions were very popular, and they were like in the number one category, uh, Rocket to You, Crush on You, Cross My Broken Heart. Those are all one of our biggest hits, and the hits that really made it in the um, in the in the pool that you're talking about, but also in the club. Uh, a lot uh, of of just spinning those records. Yeah, so good times, and uh, I'm looking forward to going through that history with you a little bit. And uh, so uh, I, you're coming to us from Las Vegas, is that right? Yes, we have our show here in Las Vegas. Uh, we're at Planet Hollywood. Been here. We we actually came here in 2019, right before COVID hit, and we established our show here, and then COVID hit. And then we were out of business for like a year and a half. And then in 2021, at the around uh, August, we were able to reopen our show. And we've been going strong ever since. Okay. Well, you had plenty of time to like get it together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it was strange to be here in Vegas. You know, Vegas doesn't sleep. But I remember driving through the strip and there was nothing. And then I realized, whoa, the world has changed. But, you know, I never thought I'd see that ever happen, but it did. And uh, you're right. We had a lot of time to uh, reconfigure our show. And luckily, we were able to do a show that's about our era. So we wanted to do a show here in Vegas, not just to sing our own hits, but also take people back to the 80s and the 90s. And that's why our our show is very popular here is because we bring them back to that time period. 
Outstanding. Uh, we'll, we'll plug that again before we say goodbye for sure. Um, I wanted to uh, have you take us back a little bit, Rudy, and just tell us a little bit about, um, you know, growing up in such a musical family and household and, you know, what was that like for you before you guys got a record deal? You know, my parents were immigrants from the islands of Tonga. And when they came here, my dad was a blue worker, a collar worker. He worked for a store chain called Safeway back in the day. He was in the milk department. And as you know, every immigrant, this is back in 1965. They came here. They arrived here. He did that for like seven years, just every odd job he can do and landed up at, at a grocery store chain. And he had just this idea of all of his kids wondering, what is he going to do with all these kids? And uh, he decided, look, he saw the Osmonds and the Jacksmen um, in their shows, um, on their television shows, and decided, look, I'm going to have this crazy idea and start a band. He kind of sat us all down together in a living room and just said, look, what do you think if we start a band? And we were young. We were impressionable. And we, he just kind of let us know, you know, what would it be like if we did something like the Osmonds and the Jacksons? And we all just bought into it as, as young kids and uh, didn't know that it was going to take a lot of practicing rehearsals. And and he bought the instruments. And luckily, my oldest brother, Leroy, um, just had a gift of picking up sounds. And he the first instrument he learned was the drums. And then my parents gave... Um, uh, hired a person to come in and teach him the guitar for two weeks. He picked that up, the bass. And what we would do back then when we first started was my parents would just buy the 45 records. Uh, those are the singles back in the day, back in the 70s. And he would just hear it on the record and just kind of learn the chords, learn how to learn the drums, and then teach me the drums, teach my brother Heine the bass, and my other sister Kathy the keys. And can you imagine? This is a 13, 14 year old doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's how we became a band in the 70s. Our first song was You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog. Um, another part of our history was when my dad started the band, that's when Elvis Presley died in 1977. And so we. Our first concert was our our elementary school a talent show, and uh, we didn't win, but uh, it was we we all realized we wanted to do this, and so from year to year we started learning more songs. We ended up creating a set, so we were a cover band doing top forty songs from nineteen seventy seven all the way to about nineteen eighty three eighty four, and the, and that's how it all started. Wow. And you gravitate towards drums yourself? No, my, my, my father just said, look, you're going to play drums. And <laughs> he just kind of put everyone in. Luckily, I mean, it was hard for me to play drums, but, you know, I learned and, it, you know, I became the drummer. That's how it all started. Yeah. And, and where did you fall in the ages of all your siblings? So I'm the third oldest. It was Leroy and then Heine and then myself. And then we had eight sisters. And then my mom and dad took a break and then, you know, an eight year break and then had more up to 17 kids. Wow. And uh, you were from uh, suburban Minneapolis, right? That's where you. So we, we, you know, we started the band in Utah, in Salt Lake City. And then, as like I was telling you, my mom and dad formed this group. It was a cover band. We also did a Polynesian review. And we ended up starting trying to find a way to showcase our, our group doing a Polynesian review and also doing top 40 music. And so what, what happened was we ended up traveling all over the Utah area, went to California, and we auditioned for Disneyland to, to become a group there. didn't work out. And then we ended up going to Canada with our show and came back in about 1981, we ended up in the Midwest. 
uh, and we started touring there, doing shows, and also this cover band all the way until 1985 when we were finally, when Prince made Minneapolis a big scene with his music, all the record labels came to Minnesota. And we happened to be one of the uh, groups performing in all the clubs there in Minnesota. And so we happened to be at the right place at the right time when Prince was uh, attracting a lot of record labels to come to Minnesota. Okay, so you were spending a lot of time there, but you weren't really from that area. Okay. No, no. We yeah. actually spent 12 years in Minnesota. We, we kind of, it, it's our second home because we lived there for so long, and that's where we were signed, and that's where we were discovered was, in, was there. Gotcha. And um, how old were you when the group got signed? I was actually um, 16 years old when the group was signed. And so it was all of us teenagers. My, my oldest brother was 19. Uh, Heine was 17. I was 16. And it went all the way down to the younger kids. Yeah. At that time, who were some of your favorite musical people? Oh, wow. A lot of rock bands. Because we did a lot of rock. Like I said, we were a cover band. Uh, Van Halen. Um, just We were top 40. Um, so we did a lot of Lover Boy. Um, uh, gosh, back in the day, ACDC, Def Leppard. I mean, you would not think, but we were that we were more of a rock group before we were signed, mm -hmm. and we did all the R and B, and then we switched over when we got signed. And so, when you did get signed by MCA, what was like the process of grooming you guys for your first record? So when we were signed to MCA Records, um, we were signed, uh, our manager, Don Powell, used to, he was the manager for a few big acts at Motown. And when we were signed, we, you know, we were not really, really um, strong writers at the time. And so he was looking for a lot of different writers and uh, was able to find a few that fit the idea that we were looking for, try to be a pop band. And so that's how we were preparing to try to figure out what kind of genre, and it was R&B pop that we decided to go with. And so what memories do you have of being in the studio and, you know, kind of getting used to what you had to do, you know, and that, and that whole process and scene? Yeah. Like I said before, we were, we were a cover band, never been in a studio before. So I remember the first time we actually went in to record our demo and our manager was struck because, you know, live the, the band sounded amazing. Once we got in the recording studio, now this is back before, you know, they had all the tricks that they do now in recording. Um, we would put the headphones on and we would try to sing and we were always off tune. It, it wasn't working out. And so our manager decided, look, you know, these guys are so used to hearing themselves uh, live. So what he did was take all of the earphones out put a small little speaker on the side where we were actually recording and all of a sudden, boom, we could hear ourselves the way we actually performed. And then when we sung, we now could sing on tune. And so it was called the playback system. And that's how we recorded all of our songs until we got used to the headphones and then all of a sudden we got used to that. But it was amazing. And, and in those days, back in the 80s, I just remember you had to sit there and go through the line over and over and over. It was a long process. For some of us, it was really hard. My sister Elizabeth, who is one of the young singers, she actually really um, was able to kind of it was it, it became natural for her and then all of a sudden she was able to put the earphones on and 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 process the music 
with the earphones on, and then it became magical. And all of a sudden, she sang You Got It All and Crush On You and all those hits because she became familiar with that process of recording. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that first record just was one of the biggest hits of that year. It started off with three smashes, Curiosity, Crush On You, and You Got It All just were the one, two, three tracks and all went top ten. Um, Up top ten, yes, and and like I said, I mean, it it helped that we were from Minneapolis. It helped that Prince. Matter of fact, Prince's um, engineer David Rifkin was our producer with Don Powell, and so when we recorded, it, it was like always that idea that we're in Minnesota, we have to represent, but we were not part of the his entourage. We were the only way we were connected to Prince was recording with his engineer, uh, David Rifkin, who also um, had his own hits. He was the older brother of the drummer for uh, Prince's drummer. Uh, I think his name is Steve. No, Steve Rifkin. Bobby uh, Bobby Z. Bobby Z, yes. Bobby Z and his other brother, who recorded all of our videos, who's now also a great um, editor in Hollywood. He was our director for all of our hit videos. Yeah. Uh, and that was uh, 85 when that first album came out. So it was before Paisley yeah. Park was built, uh, but it was yeah. like maybe just about to be built. Um, it was really starting to happen, uh, you know, in terms of that there and uh david z's been on the show so we talked a little bit about you guys on, oh, on that great. Yeah, yeah. yeah um but um what track did you first hear on the radio what did that feel like oh my gosh we were doing a promotional and we were up in the detroit area detroit michigan and that's the first time we actually heard our song on the radio and it just blew us away i mean it was a dream come true to hear our parents talk about you know what it'd be like to 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 have a hit record and just to hear us it was ourselves hearing curiosity for the first time and then all of a sudden you know we heard ourselves over and over that first promotional tour in 1985 in the fall of 1985 it was just magical it was the first time touring outside of the midwest and i remember going from uh where was it? Where was it? Washington, D.C. And just doing a promotional tour up towards New York and then coming down and going to Atlanta, flying all over the place. Doing that promotional tour was just a it was a, it was amazing to finally see and hear ourselves um, being plugged <laughs> in radio all over the country. And so you guys did you guys have tutors or how was everyone keeping up with school? So the, the the way it worked was basically we had a tutor who came on and for my sisters, I was old enough to be on my own. And, but my sisters, because they were younger, had to have a tutor. And so when the tutor worked with me, it was once in a while, but for my sisters, Liz and Moana, they were always with them. So, you know, you guys were, kids but i mean i felt like the songs and the music uh had a certain maturity beyond maybe your guys years because of the people that you had involved i think in the production and the musicians and you know and it did have a touch of that minneapolis feel uh kind of uh actually like some of the label mates at mca like jody watley was doing stuff that had a little bit of that influence and uh, climax was on mca too um and later, you know, Paula Abdul um, with her stuff. But um, it must have been so intense, though, you know, uh, and a whirlwind for you guys. Yeah, it was because, again, we were just experiencing, you know, being on our own as a family and then having to be a part of this whole Minneapolis sound. Like I said, when we recorded the record, um, David brought in a lot of uh, uh, musicians to come and help us on this record because again um it needed to be a, a hit record and so we had a lot of help from that whole crowd of people that were there that were top notch in minneapolis at the time 
Um, and so we were really, really um, um, blessed to be able to rub shoulders with all these great musicians that were there during the Prince era, the time, um, and just being part of the whole Minneapolis sound for us was just amazing. Uh, it must have exceeded expectations even with how successful that record was, you know? Yeah, it was because we didn't know. I mean, honestly, when, when we were signed, MCA was the last record label that to, to take a, to to uh, sign us because we we went to Warner Brothers we went to all the other labels it was that last record um, label that decided to take us on. Hmm. And how much time did you guys spend? You know, uh, going through choreography and you know rehearsing and that kind of. Th yeah, it took. You know, that was something very familiar with us because we did that all the time. Um, but to have our own, you know. Before we would rehearse other people's material. Now this is our material, and we had to kind of create our own choreography, which I was responsible for. Um, and you know, we have a move in "Crush on You" that everyone emulates when we go when we perform it. And so we just was trying to figure out something that we could do that was 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 just us. And uh, luckily, it worked, and we were very blessed that it worked. Did you guys tend to get along well? Most of the time, yes. But <laughs> as you know, brothers and sisters, um, it was hard sometimes, you know, being with my brothers, uh, trying to figure out things because sometimes the the family issues would come up, you know, in in rehearsals. And we were typical brother and sisters. We had our own issues, our own fights, and uh, but luckily we had parents that kept us together, parents that helped us, you know, resolve some of the issues that we had at the time. And I believe that, uh, you know, it was both a blessing and sometimes a hardship being brothers and sisters. Mm. I got to mention really a few of those musicians that you were alluding to because uh, folks that are watching, a lot of them will know them. Uh, the Peterson brothers, Ricky and Paul. Yes, Ricky and Paul, um, and their sister, who sang also. She was a great singer. I forgot her name, but she's one of the Petersons, and she helped sing a lot of uh, session singers that, that came in and helped on Crush on You. And also, um, Jerry Knight was very involved in that first record, and he had a yeah. lot of prior success with bands like Radio and uh, Break In, uh, Ain't no stopping us. That was a big hit, and uh, uh, also War Wardell Potts, drummer from the Solar Records hits. <laughs> yeah, I mean it was great. I mean I remember we loved the movie Breaking, and then to find out that you know we we, we used to actually do his song in in one of our shows. You know when we were doing cover uh, um, band stuff back in the it, tra traveling, and actually say, hey, he actually wrote a song. And what was, what was interesting was when Don Powell discovered him and Aaron Z, um, in a, uh, I, I'm not sure which place there in Hollywood, but the first song that they heard was Love Umbrella, which was a song that we thought was going to be one of the singles. That was a song that actually attracted Don Powell to say, hey, let's get these two guys in here. When they came to Minnesota, that's when they – Figured out, okay, let's do Curiosity. I remember hearing Curiosity. Everyone was like, yeah, Curiosity. And it was after Curiosity that they inspired to write Crush on You. So Crush on You came on a little later. But I find it fascinating that the 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 the, 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 sing, the, the song that became the single wasn't the, the one that actually we initially recorded. It was Love Umbrella then Curiosity, and then Crush on You. And I remember when we heard Crush on You for the first time in the studio, we all knew that that was the hit. That was, that was the pop hit. And I remember them discussing with us that, you know, let's release Curiosity. That will be our R&B debut song. But we're going to wait on both Crush on You and the ballad that came later, You Got It All. And everyone, I just remember hearing a, when we had our um, 
record um, party when we were just listening to all the music, um, everyone knew that Crush on You and You Got It All would be singles and they would probably be our hit singles. And lo and behold, they became our hit singles. <laughs> yeah, because those crossed over pop and Curiosity was uh, R&B. Um, yes. Interesting also, Rudy, you had a, a remake of the Delphonics classic, La La Means I Love You on there, uh, which, yeah. interestingly enough, uh, like 10 years later, Prince did it on his Emancipation album also. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, I remember... Um, our, don, our our manager is saying, look, we're going to need to find a song that was a hit before and make it our, our own. And yeah, I just remember that being maybe a single. Um, it never did become our single, but it it added to um, every time we do that Delphonics hit and do our own version, people identify that, yeah, that's, that's also part of your song was La La Means I Love You. So the second album, Magic, uh, was pretty much a match as far as success goes, uh, which is no small accomplishment, uh, you know. Was there anything uh, particularly different that you approached it with, you know, compared to that first one? Well, I just remember our manager saying, look, everyone, we don't want to become a one-hit wonder. We had a hit. We sold a million units. And I just remember... Um, in 1987, uh, our manager was looking for something that, you know, we could do. And so what we decided to do was uh, record a song called Cross My Broken Heart. And uh, Don Powell introduced us to some of the writers that wrote a lot of material for Madonna. And so Cross My Broken Heart came out in 1987 while we were still recording uh, the Magic album. And I just remember um, still we went through a lot of material trying to find songs that would be hits. I mean, to be honest with you, we were looking for hits. We, we didn't want to just be a one-hit wonder. And I remember touring in 1987. And as we were touring, um, we were looking for material. And I remember having to go into rec recording studios to record any time. And we also were recording um, uh, Rocket to You. And we had finished a lot of the album uh, in the spring, but we still were looking for material. It was, it was, it was really weird. And I just remember in the summer, we, um, Don Powell and a few writers wrote uh, Make It Real. And I remember hearing the the demo. I still have it somewhere. It was just um, the 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 writer singing it, and we just knew, oh my gosh, this is going to be a hit. Make it real. And I remember we had to go record. We were actually we recorded part of the song, I think, in Ohio, and then we flew. I flew with my sister Elizabeth and Leroy. We flew all the way to Texas before the rest of the group came there so that we had time to record before our concert that we were going to do the following day. So we flew into, I think, San Antonio to record um, Elizabeth. And at that time, Elizabeth was, was um, I think she just got it in the studio. And I just remember when they when we got into the studio and we were only there, we we're only supposed to be there for about three or four hours. I was actually sitting in the recording studio, hearing my sister do a one take of, of the verses of make it real. And I just remember Don Powell and the producers going, wow, we didn't have to go through the whole process of doing line by line, the song. Liz just was on fire. She just had the emotion. She knew how to sell this song. And I just remember hearing them just do it maybe two or three takes. And instead of chopping up the 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 the, the song and trying to refit each uh, um, verse, she just went through it. And then Don Paul said, just do it again. 
and do it again. I just remember hearing it back, and I remember Don Pell, we got it. We have it. <laughs> we have the song. She didn't have to go through it over and over like she had to do uh, You Got It All because she wasn't experienced. When she delivered, she delivered, and it was just perfect. So when you hear Make It Real, it's her actually doing it one time throughout the whole through the whole song. She delivered. Mm-hmm. So I just remember that being in the recording studio and then then having our concert, and then we knew, oh, we got this in the can. Hmm. You guys have become seasoned pros already. She did, yeah. I mean, uh, as a singer, she just and and it, it's you know when I sometimes when I'm shopping and I'm at, or at, when I'm at uh, Walmart or Target, and then all of a sudden, boom! I hear "Make It Real" or "Crushing You." Come, it just blows me away. Like that, that's us, on, that's us up there, you know, in music now, you know. Uh, and it's just weird. It's just weird to hear that. And, and that was done so long ago, you know? Yeah. And you had, uh, well, that track made it to number one on the adult contemporary. Yeah. But know? I'm going to tell you a story what happened, you know, and I, it, 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 it's, it's actually an unfortunate thing that happened when they were trying to plan out how the singles were going to come out. And, uh, our first single was Cross My Broken Heart. And then the second single was um, was Rocket to You. We released a single, Rocket to You, with a... I remember doing a video in Hollywood, and that was supposed to play out its whole strategy. Or And as that was happening, a, a radio station out in Miami bypassed Rocket 2 and started playing Make It Real. And then all of a sudden, while Rocket 2, the camp, the, 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 the single campaign for Rocket 2 was going on, it was competing against a bunch of radio stations picking up Make It Real. And unfortunately, it kind of, uh, it, it, we had to rush, and because there was no time, to set up, make it real, we had to just go in. I just remember Don Powell telling us we got to go and we got to shoot a very cheesy. Uh, there are two versions of our of our single uh, 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 videos of Make It Real, and they're not really done well. Not not the, the the amount of time we spent doing the other songs, but we had to rush in. And I remember going into Channel Eleven which is a um, television station up in Minnesota and cutting a, you know, on a blue screen, a, the, the, the video for make it real. And uh, it wasn't done on, on film. It was done, you know, with a, you know, a video camera. And when you see that video, you could tell it's very cheesy because it was done very, very cheaply to get, a, a video out and then when we we had time we went in and shot another video of make it real so there's two versions of make it real out there videos all because a radio station in um M- miami started playing make it real and it just a bunch of other radio stations started you know um playing it so it kind of fouled up the whole the marketing of both Rocket You and Maker. They're both, they made top 10 hits, but uh, it, it, I believe that had Make It Real been positioned better, it would have it would have went to number one um, and stayed there for a long time. But it was just this whole thing was, was fouling up the marketing of both singles. Hmm. Well, knowing that, I mean, it's especially fortuitous, I think, that uh, Rocket 2 got to number six pop and uh, Make It Real got to number one, AC and number four pop. Um, so they're yeah. still top 10, you know? They're, they're still top 10, but could you imagine if had they had it worked properly? I mean, it, it, they, they just, uh, it, the way it works in radio is that you have to have a bunch of radio stations plugging it at a certain time to get all of them in sync, but 
it was competing against against each other. And that's what created this whole thing where it didn't necessarily get to number one. And that was, I remember having that conversation with our manager that um, that was happening. So. And uh, some of the people on this album, you had uh, Jimmy Brallower, who's been on the show, uh, doing some mm -hmm. of the drum programming and you had TM Stevens on bass, great bass player. Um, yeah, we had a lot of great, uh, you know, session players that that helped us play and uh our manager said look you know you i know you guys can play it live but when it comes to studio work it needs to be precise and this is before the days where you know today you could do a lot of stuff because you know you have the technology back then um we we really relied on a lot of session players and uh bobby nunn was behind rocket to you who uh, yeah. was a big uh you know r&b uh artist in his own right and his brother billy has been on the show as well so yeah 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 it was really good to work with them and i just remember you know the comparison because rocket 2 was a song that he actually floated to earth wind and fire and we found out that we were going to actually um be able to sing and that song it was like yes because earth wind and fire was one of our favorite uh uh groups and just the fact that it could have been their song and it was our song uh we loved it you know we we weren't ashamed of being a producers group uh we i know we didn't write all the hits um and we started writing after but like i said before we were a band that did a lot of cover tunes back in the 80s and we were lucky that uh we had the opportunity to get a recording um contract with with mca records and uh and so we were the face of all of that music and we were glad to be a part of that i mean a lot of people wonder well you didn't write your own music you're right we didn't write our movie so did elvis presley he didn't write his own music but you know our goal was to come out and to work with writers that had great songs and to find those songs and to make it our own and so we're happy with that, even though a lot of people said, well, you're not a real artist because you guys don't have um, real music. And unfortunately, we weren't blessed that way. But still, you know, when I look at Ma the Madonnas of the world and the Michael Jacksons of the world and um, and the Elvis Presley of the world, um, they're artists in their own right. And that's kind of the artist we were like we were we were that that's category of of ours that we were compared to so interesting in the sequencing to me that cross my broken heart was the closer um seems so upbeat uh seems like you know almost like it would more lead off a record yeah well it, it came out first because it came out in 1987 before the magic album came out like i said we needed something we you know most of the songs from the, our, our debut album, um, they appeared in 1986. And we needed something to hold us over, and that was Cross My Broken Heart. Um, and then we had um, our, our album come out in 1988, The Magic Album. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.